Okay, we're live, I think. Mark, can you hear me okay, yeah? Yeah, all good. Cool. Like, How are we doing, guys? Uh, welcome to a new episode of the podcast here with Mark Morton from Skilling Mining in Cork, a fellow Irish man. Um, yeah, Mark, do you want to just, uh, a lot of you guys probably know him, but if you want to do a quick background intro and just how you got into the Bitcoin space. Yeah, so I am the managing director and a co-founder of Skilling Digital Mining, which is Ireland's only Bitcoin mining company. Um, and this year we got uh, a large scale mining site up and running, co-located with an anaerobic digester, which essentially is a mine running off of biogas. Um, I suppose a small bit more on myself. I got into the crypto space in quotes um, in 2019. Spent quite a long time going down the DeFi rabbit hole and spending too much time on Ethereum, um, but ultimately pivoted completely back to, to Bitcoin only. Um, and that pivot inevitably led me to, to getting interested in mining and, and finding some like individuals that wanted to start a, a Bitcoin business, an Irish Bitcoin business at the beginning that inevitably became a Bitcoin, an Irish Bitcoin mining business, which became skilling digital mining. So over the past kind of four years, I've gone from crypto to Bitcoin to Bitcoin mining to um, managing a Bitcoin mining company. So that's kind of the, the crash course in, in my little journey over the past while. Yeah, yeah. And we're just saying before the call, um, Mad, it's not really related to mining. Well, I suppose maybe there's more miners after, you know, big public miners after capitulating. But um, Mad few weeks, uh, do you have any... Do you have any thoughts around that? Do you um do you think it's good for Bitcoin? Do you think it's bad for Bitcoin? Um, and how does it look for the mining space? I suppose. Yeah, well, I suppose in the short term, you know, Bitcoin is always just going to be kind of tarnished by you know the negative connotations of the space as a whole. Um, and I suppose that's kind of the, the short term negative spin here, which is unfortunately people aren't able to di differentiate between you know what ftx is what bitcoin is what other cryptocurrencies are it all just gets lumped into the one kind of umbrella um, and it's why the space is just as noisy as it is and it's kind of as projects have developed over the past kind of two or three years new people coming into the space aren't able to differentiate and as a result of that then when stuff like this happens bitcoin gets you know hit with it um but overall i think it'll probably be a, you know a long-term good thing as people are now trying to differentiate between you know what is it that ftx was and ftt tokens were you know why did why did they allow ftx to do what they did and how are they different from bitcoin and ethereum and i think i kind of as as an individual went on that same process whereby i was buying a lot of these projects in 2019 and 2020 thinking that they were going to be the next big thing, but wasn't understanding what was going on in the back end and why were they actually important. And so I was reading roadmaps and, you know, reading, you know, looking at presentations and decks that the people who had created these tokens were showing. And I can see a lot of overlap with what's happened with FTX, whereby, you know, valuations and words and roadmaps are, are absolutely no representation of what's going on in the background and the actual integrity of the project itself. And I didn't really understand that, to be honest. So when I was investing in a lot of outcome projects, I was thinking, look, this is what they've promised. This is who they're working with. This is who they're being endorsed by. And I, in my mind, that was a, you know, a strong indicator of that they were going in the right direction. And I think that FTX um, and obviously the FTT token that's associated with it was just a, a prime, prime example of this, which is instead of looking at you know, the core integral details of FTX as a business and FTT as a token, people were instead looking at who is SPF speaking with, you know, who does he associate himself with and who else is backing this? And so then you kind of get into this vicious cycle of, you know, essentially using the word pandemics, which is instead of looking at, you know, what's important here, you're just relying on the words of someone before you to tell you that it's something that you should be getting involved in. And the problem here is that it snowballed so much that you had, you know, seasoned investors that have, you know, built their wealth over three decades spouting that FTX was the kind of Hail Mary of, of crypto projects to be in, in involved in. Um, and then it got to such an extent that, you know, you're seeing the losses across the industry that, that we've seen in the past kind of two or three weeks. But as I said at the very beginning, it, it is this kind of trial by fire process that led me to go to Bitcoin only um, and kind of sadly, but hopefully for the better in the long term, a lot of people will go through that same process now. And ultimately, the, hopefully, the conclusion that they'll come to is that you know Bitcoin is is what I should be focusing my time on. Yeah, look, I think at the end of the day, most people, and it's it's very unfortunate and like sad what's happened, but I think it's 
kind of was always going to happen um didn't think it would happen like that or in that way but at some level it, it just had to happen but um most people only learn by getting burnt like so you can do, try and do all the you know preach in the world bitcoin only or whatever um but you only really get it and i was the exact same as yourself with DeFi and all that like you only really get it after the fact in most cases um yeah, yeah but i think i think it's, it's such a it's almost a funny one which is whereby i was investing in DeFi, but i was looking to a core group of individuals to tell me where the project was going and then basing my, my kind of interests and investment in that project based off of what this core group was telling me they were doing even though what i was thought i was investing in was DeFi, and i think it's it's just kind of a, a kind of mad you know circular loop here which is you know you are seeing some people conclude you know oh this is better for DeFi, you know because this will do away with centralized you know exchanges or centralized entities like sbf and alameda um, and ftx and they're not even questioning you know who's in the back end of this DeFi project in quotes that i'm investing in which is you know a complete conflict of interest there which is you think that this is where DeFi will now excel and you're not even kind of acknowledging that how decentralized really is this DeFi project that i'm investing in um, and i'm hoping that you know people will kind of start to kind of look at that a bit more which is that's exactly what i was doing which is i was investing in DeFi, but it, actually what i was investing in was centralized DeFi's projects which is just you know in reality kind of complete nonsense to an extent yeah 100 percent. look even if god we, we, we can touch on this later with like proof of stake and validators and all that but like even if it's maybe on some of those projects are maybe on some level decentralized at the moment and that's assuming the fundamentals of the projects are flawed um but like as the exchanges and right and big institutions start controlling more of the validating stake um eventually the regulators can just come in and just say you know guys you're doing this now and that'll be it like would you agree with that actually with that do you think that's accurate assessment yeah i think like in in general like to an extent like what i what i realized over the course of the past four years that decentralization is the, the most you know important part and i think that unfortunately it's kind of a harsh statement but like people in my mind are, are the kind of biggest single point of failure for some of these projects which is you know even if they have the best intentions and that's something that i saw with a lot of DeFi projects which is even if the people have the best in intentions and i think sometimes it is harsh to call you know try playing everyone as scammers in the space because there are people that try to build projects with the best of intentions but ultimately they might run out of investment they might run out of motivation you know they might run out of kind of ideas as to where to bring the project next and inevitably that project failed because even though it was decentralized in quotes it was relying on a core group of people to keep up the funding to keep getting new vcs in to kind of fund the next step as to where the project would go and ultimately the project died um, and then I and I think when I come back to Bitcoin, which is that Bitcoin ultimately removes that dependence on any one group of people. I and mean, that's why this is the kind of whole anti-fragile nature, which is you were talking about regulation, is that when people try to regulate this whole space, given what's gone on, I think they'll kind of come to the conclusion that, you know, Bitcoin is a network and the rest of these things are, are almost kind of companies. But I think that that's also kind of just a weak argument in general when people start spouting the kind of whole securities aspect of these DeFi projects. I think irrespective of way before regulation, centralized entities controlling these projects will be the single point of failure that ultimately brings them down in the end prior to them being regulated. You know, I think the whole point of this space, and it's something that I do agree with when people start spouting this whole idea about DeFi projects being securities is that we're kind of on the whole idea and issue was a bit of a cypherpunk movement. And if, if you're kind of going to securities and regulators as a, as a win for Bitcoin against these things, I think it's kind of a bit of a cop out as well. So I, I think I tried to remove that and just say that irrespective of the regulation that's coming, the people in these projects will, in my mind, ultimately probably be one of the kind of points of failure that bring, the, bring them down. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I, I think as well though, that like, you know, the way like, all the don't want to say the small guys but you know the normal people in the space who aren't your vc uh you know silicon valley backers or whatever so just think of ftx like those guys all the projects they were putting money into it's more like they're just putting money into some kind of story and figuring out can they make money off a token pump off it and it's like one of one of the mad things i heard with ftx 
Now, to be honest, I'm not totally sure, just caveat, that if this is totally accurate, you might have more insight in this. Um, I think it is, though. But like they were doing, they were basically taking user funds to make investments in projects, taking FTX user funds to make investment in projects through Alameda. And then they were basically saying that those projects had to put the funds back on the exchange that they just mm -hmm. made the investment in. Yeah. Um, and it's like, even though the funds are back on the stage, on, on the exchange, they also now have some token that they're going to be pumping on the exchange. And then FTX would just sell the token or Alameda into the pump then. And it's yeah. all like, you know, the way me and you are talking here about decentralization and all that, it's like, do those people actually really care about any of this at all? Or is it just like, you know, is it just what the story that um, can be sold to, to do the pump? Like, yeah, what do you think of that? Yeah, like, I, I think it's just when, when there's so little barriers to entry, you know, there was nothing stopping this happening, you know, over and over and over again. And then I think it goes back to, having unfortunately having new investors coming into the space which were the retail traders not understanding what was important and basing their investments on on roadmaps and what they were being told to invest in you know which is this whole idea of you know pump and dump scams which is instead of people doing their due diligence and kind of thinking you know what's really important which in my mind now is decentralization and longevity anti-fragility all of these things but when i first got into the space it was you know who's going to partner with amazon you know who's going to change sh shipping who's going to get you know like who's rumored to be partnering with you know coca-cola on changing their you know entire system via blockchain you know that's what i was looking at and i think that's that's like part of the reason that these things still work for these people um but i think that this is that whole narrative of, of move move fast and break things the reason they're able to move fast and break things is because they have unsuspecting retail traders that will take the other side of that um unfortunately but i think then you know when you look at bitcoin it's been created in a way that it was a one-off and i didn't realize that at the beginning i did also think that bitcoin was the boring one amongst all these and that this whole idea of kind of you've one shot at making a decentralized network and doing it correctly and ha having a network that will stay you know anti-fragile for decades and decades and decades wasn't what interested me at the beginning it was all these other kind of concepts um, and unfortunately that is what allowed you know them to continuously spin up new tokens you know garner interest by saying you know this is the next big thing and they're going to partner with these individuals and they're going to revolutionize this you know traditional financial system and ultimately they hadn't plans to do none of that they were just able to make their quick money and and, and be gone again so i think there's so many kind of different aspects to, to what went on and unfortunately it was just as i said earlier the snowball effect of so many different kind of wrongdoings that kind of got us to where we are now which is the whole thing inevitably falling apart yeah yeah totally agree um but uh yeah the the partner with like coca-cola or something that's a good one like you know <laughs> like it's just like no one has to tell you even what it means in any way shape. No, no, it's no. like oh we, we've done a partnership with coca-cola like and it's, it could be like an email from coke to say yeah we might look at this like you know yeah it's like, we'll, re we'll read your slide deck that you sent us you know what i mean but it's to me but that's just my biggest problem which is that's the stuff that got me into the space at the beginning and it's something that i wasted you know 18 months you know to two years on you know probably 18 months on it, thereabouts um uh, before realizing you know what am i actually investing in here you know as in i i think i'm reading roadmaps i think these things are going to change the world but i don't even know who created them you know you see all these things coming up which are you know you like you'll have they'll spin up a name and it'll be like you know blockchain labs or whatever it might be i don't know if that's actually a thing i'm just saying that there'll be someone in the background that i don't even know who they are you know as i said before to someone that could be five guys that know solidity but they were good enough to come up with a token and tokenomics and then they were able to spin up you know 20 grand between each other to put out a press release and and that's like in a lot of instances that's all it takes to kind of get the ball rolling um but this was no i knew none of this and i think that's kind of a, a problem and i think but as you said earlier which is like what's the outcome of this it's people kind of hopefully being more skeptical of what they're looking at and not taking everything at face value and then going back to first principles and saying god i've spent i've invested i have a, a portfolio here of 30 altcoins that four of them apparently were all going to revolutionize the same system and none of them did it and seven other ones are meant to do this and it's been three years and you know the discord is basically you know tumbleweed so like what have i actually been buying what have i been investing in 
what's actually important here. And unfortunately, some people will probably leave the space for good. And I think that is one negative kind of takeaway from this is that people will feel so hard done by and so burnt by what's gone on over the past number of months and years that they'll leave and never come back. But there will be some that will hopefully go away and say, look, what's important? And I think you are seeing that actually on Twitter at the moment, whereby you're seeing people kind of think about this whole thing and say, look, okay, I've been a big advocate for, for DeFi and for a number of these altcoins, but I think now what I'm going to do is just focus on Bitcoin and Bitcoin only. And you're seeing a lot of people push back against that, but I think that like, that is what I'm hoping is, is the outcome for this, but I suppose only time will tell. You know, you could fast forward two years and you know the altcoin market comes back booming again because you have more unsuspecting individuals coming in not quite understanding what they're getting themselves into. But, you know, we'll see. Yeah, but look, hopefully the cohort of people who really know, it don't sound arrogant, like, but who've been through all this before and can kind of speak to it, there's more people to speak to this that hopefully won't be as effective next time. But look, maybe this is just going to keep happening after every like Bitcoin having. So, yeah, who knows? Um, but OK, so mining like this conversation, you know, that wanted to talk about like for ages, <laughs> just get yeah. like really deep into the mining. Um, well, not really deep, but just, uh, you know, just cover everything. Um, mining nodes, all that good stuff, uh, like 51 percent attacks, that kind of thing. A lot of people in Bitcoin, I think, understand it uh, or think they understand it um, or claim to. But have a lot of difficulty uh explaining it so like I, i've heard you explain this succinctly like really well a lot of times um so look I, I suppose um just the first question around this is just mining explain this most simple terms like how do you think about it how do you how do you explain it to someone that doesn't really understand yeah well my, my general go-to is this whole concept of the blockchain itself being kind of just a conveyor belt of, of boxes you know slowly but surely moving along in the conveyor belt and as the kind of next block appears or the next box um that block will have you know a header at the top of it that essentially is almost like i imagine a combination code on a lock um and what all the machines are doing which are asics you know any mining machine you know s19j pros if people have heard of that word before all these machines are doing all around the world when you see these big facilities of kind of whirring machines is that they're just firing guesses at that header in order to get the correct guess in order for the combination code to be unlocked that then allows that block to be added to the blockchain and all this process just happens you know 24 hours a day seven days a week um, and it's almost just like a consistent lottery so this happens every 10 minutes so a new block will appear on average every 10 minutes with a new header at the top that ultimately kind of needs to be guessed um, and as soon as that uh, header is guessed or that combination code is guessed that block will be added and will be on to the next lottery and this lottery just repeats constantly every 10 minutes and has done so for the past you know 13 years so in simplest terms that's all that's happening so a lot of kind of media outlets try frame it um as solving complex maths equations but when i first got into the space one thing that really confused me is that i thought then okay well, well what happens if a really old machine wins a block you know because you hear the phrase wins a block i was thinking well surely a, a machine that came out seven or eight years ago will then kind of block up the blockchain and spend ages trying to solve this complex maths equation. But what I didn't realize is that when you get on the skin of it, there's nothing being solved. There's no complex maths equation that takes time. It's simply a guess. So a brand new machine that's 100 terahashes or a really old machine that's from you know 2016, if either one of them guesses correctly, that's it. That's the lottery over and we go on to the next 10 minute block period. Um, so that's kind of generally what I try to do away with which is this whole idea of solving complex maths equations because i remember that being a, a kind of stumbling block for me it's literally just a lottery and these machines are guessing yeah um and then so they're guessing if you have a really old machine uh, what can you do then i presume you can rather than just solar mine you can put it in a mining pool so a lot of people are going to say uh what are my what's the point of mining pools how do they work yeah so essentially a mining pool will, will they were created essentially to aggregate guesses together. So there was a stage where people would mine solo in quotes, whereby you could switch on a machine um, and it would start firing guesses, you know, link the Bitcoin core. Um, but the key problem there is that you could wait, you know, 10 years before you ever win a block, you know, so you could have your machine on pulling energy, costing you money um, and you might win nothing. And so pools came along and said, look, well, what happens if we 
basically create like you know you do a syndicate for the lottery you know where your office might all chip in some money and if someone wins then you get a share and it's this very very similar kind of idea which is what mining pools do is they aggregate guesses together from machines all over the world um, and if someone else in the pool wins so if a different machine wins you get a cut of that bitcoin block reward that the pool wins but that bitcoin block reward that you get is just proportionate to the amount of guesses that you sent um, so if, for instance you know a, a pool might have a thousand terahashes which is in 10 brand new s19s 100 terahash s19s um in reality a pool will have thousands and thousands and thousands of terahashes but for simplicity's sake we'll just say that a pool has a thousand terahashes in there if i only have one machine running in here and nine others have machines all over the world if anyone else in the pool wins then i'll get 10 percent of the 6.25 bitcoin um, and that just essentially happens what well, that's essentially what the pool does is aggregate guesses together um, and it allows you to smooth out your revenue curve so instead of you winning one block every 17 years um, the pool itself might win 10 blocks a day and you might get 0. 0.0003 bitcoin consistently every single day and it just allows you as a as a as a miner to smooth out your revenue curve which then allows you to do some financial modeling and say you know when on average will i probably pay this machine back um, so that's kind of their, their core input there. Yeah, because otherwise, like, if you had, if you were going solo on it, you could be like, you know, you might have to mine like for five years or something, maybe even long, maybe forever <laughs> before yeah, you hit any block. And so, you might get nodding, exactly, yeah. So this, uh, yeah, so it allows to um, aggregate as a percentage of the hash rate in that pool uh, for when the blocks are mined. So brilliant. Yeah. So just then, um, so between the mining mining and nodes so a lot of people get confused here like even for a long time up until about 2017 a lot of people kind of considered like the miners to be the nodes it wasn't you know the that the miners should make all the decisions um and the block size wars is a great book talking about all this by jonathan beer but um like so you have the mining what is the relationship between mining and nodes how, how would you so as first Firstly, like what are nodes and then what's the relationship between them? Yeah, so, well, in simplest terms, a, a node is just anything that has, or any kind of computer program is the way I like to say it, that has a full copy of, of the Bitcoin ledger. Um, and it's basically more so of a, of a consensus method that allows you to look back over the, the blockchain from its you know creation in 2009 to now and say that every single block has been added to the blockchain as it should. Um, and they're kind of the gatekeepers that ensure that that blockchain is consistently being added. Blocks are being consistently added in the correct manner. Um, but what mining is more so is, is a civil mechanism. So there's a key kind of difference there, which is mining is more of a civil mechanism um, and, and the nodes kind of represent a consens consensus mechanism. What a civil mechanism essentially is, is it's a manner in which you can encourage individuals that are participating in the network and in, you know running the network to behave in a, in, in a proper manner. They're essentially your method of having skin in the game. Um, and that's essentially what mining is. So the proof of work civil mechanism is that I have to buy a machine. I have to then go find energy. I don't have to go pay for that energy. And then that's my skin in the game in order to be a, you know, a miner and ensure that I behave correctly and build blocks correctly and, and participate as I should. Um, and then essentially, so how the mining process essentially works is that you know, a pool actually constructs the block. So if you have all the miners in the pool, a pool will construct the block. They'll put all the transactions in that occurred in that 10 minute period, for example. And as soon as that block is created and mined, it will broadcast that block. And what the nodes will do is they'll essentially say, yeah, that was done correctly. And it'll let it get added to the blockchain. So they, you know, it's basically kind of the, the best way that you can decorrelate miners and nodes and ensure that both are being kept in check, essentially. Yeah. And it, like if the miners are, if the block is broadcast and the miners detect it as fraudulent, whatever they reject, or sorry, the nodes detect it as fraudulent, they reject it. And then basically all the nodes are checking that that block is correct. They're all talking to each other to make, like they, they, they have the rules of how the network operates as such. Exactly, yeah. And it's as the key thing there, as I said earlier, which is that your simple mechanism in this instance is that if a miner was to expend all that energy, were to buy all those machines and were to then behave in an incorrect manner, um, and that block was then rejected by the nodes, that all that capital expenditure would then be wasted. So that's kind of the key aspect there, which is why would a miner behave, you know, in a way that they shouldn't if they have their skin in the game as they do? Um, and so it's kind of the, the manner in which they interact is kind of the key important part of maintaining that blockchain 
and encouraging all participants in the blockchain to maintain the integrity of the chain of truth, which is literally the blockchain itself. So they're then working in tandem to make sure that that's done correctly. Mm -hmm. 100%. Um, that's a great explanation. So like, is there, is there any way um, like this could be corrupted, this whole process, so kind of the incentive flywheel could break? Or I know what you said there, that um, there's no incentive as such for them to act against their own network. Um, but like, I don't know, a lot of people might say, like, what if the state just turns around and they say they're going to ban proof of work, they want to stop? Is there any way this whole thing can be stopped in your view? Yeah, well, I think the kind of best things that I like to look back on is just kind of real life examples, essentially, which is, you know, the proof of work process. Um, you know, as you alluded to earlier, the first one is just being a 51% attack, whereby someone tries to get 51% of the global hash rate. Um, and when they do, then, then that will give them power to dictate blocks in any manner that they wish. And that could be trying to undo the blockchain itself and go back and change transactions that have already happened. But it could be something much, much simpler, whereby if someone had 51% global hash rate and they were the ones constructing and forming blocks, um, they could essentially decide to include no transactions at all every single time that they, as a block appeared, which obviously would block up the, the entire network itself and allow people to be, you know, they'll be unable then to transact on the blockchain. Um, but I suppose the kind of key factor of that and the key example that we have is firstly you have china that attempted to ban it um, and as soon as that ban happened people you know we saw the global hash rate plummet um, and you saw people then start referencing you know how much money would it take for you to buy 51 percent of the global hash rate when it's kind of in this weakened state and attack the network um, and ultimately nothing happened anywhere close to that because another kind of key aspect of the proof of work process is this kind of real world link which is in order for you to participate in the proof of work process and the bitcoin network you logistically need to find the energy, you need to purchase the machines, you need to set up your mining farm, and then you need to go through the process of 51% attacking Bitcoin network. So as much as people will put on a figure which would say, look, if you were to buy all the machines in order to get 51% of the global hash rate, it'll cost you X amount. You know, you see people trying to run these figures. You then also need to work through the logistics of actually doing that, which is building a facility large enough to run the machines and then having energy cheap enough to keep that those machines running in order to conduct the attack. So I think ultimately it's a lot, lot harder than people kind of let on. And as much as people try to put figures on a 51% attack, it doesn't really materialize. Um, but in, a, in simpler terms, as you kind of said earlier, which is this whole concept of, of regulation with Bitcoin itself and proof of work being, you know, as centralized in my mind as it is, you had someone like China step up and say, look, we're going to ban this process completely. Hash rate seemingly left. You know, you saw China, the global hash rate plummeted. You saw that apparently hash rate in China went to zero. Another study was conducted six months later, and it seems like China has, you know, 15% to 20% of the global hash rate again. So, you know, banning this as a process is extremely, extremely difficult. Um, and as an attack vector, you know, it, I don't think it, it merits as much worry as, as people kind of think it does. Yeah. And I suppose the other thing as well, like you can't, you can't really hide it can you like you because the point is if it's going to take a very long time to develop the capability to mount a 51 percent attack and it's assuming that the network you know the cyber hornets nest or whatever sailor calls it doesn't take steps to you know just outright ban all those miners from interacting with it or something is that, that correct yeah well i suppose like even before you get into anything like that it just logistically it's just so difficult you know like obviously so the first kind of thing people say is a lot to stop a, a government organization printing the money to then go buy the machines but like you know you talk to anyone you know saying that you're going to go out and buy that many machines is fine in practice but you know reaching out to you know a bitmain or a watts miner or now intel are getting in the mix and saying you know we'll take an order for a couple of hundred thousand machines you know logistically getting your hands on them and then getting to the location that you need that has the cheap electricity and then being able to construct a facility large enough in order to conduct a 51 percent attack is just extremely extremely difficult so at this stage i don't even really look when people try to put a monetary value on it i think that the logistical difficulties of conducting a 51 percent attack is just so much more important than the kind of cost of accumulating the hardware because i think ultimately the cost of accumulating the hardware is irrelevant because i think it's so difficult to accumulate that hardware anyway that conducting the attack is is, is ultimately too difficult yeah so and just correct me here folks like 
I, I'm definitely not an expert in mining, but like as well, my understanding is that fifty one percent attack it's not even really like kicked out to, to be what it's meant people say it is, in that like all you can do with a fifty one percent attack is you can you, the the miners that control the fifty one percent hash rate can choose to censor certain blocks. Um, so or from certain wallet addresses so like if you if you, for example china or the us had control of 51 percent the network they could say they don't like mark or they don't like me and they're not going to process transactions from that um that wallet um that's one part and the other thing is that they can only spend double spend their own bitcoin so they can't just rob everyone's wallets everywhere um yeah yeah i think is ultimately it, what you're, you're getting at is like this is just this like in my mind this the only purpose really of a 51 percent attack would be to bring down the network itself it wouldn't be a profit okay a profiteering yeah. venture you know like ultimately if, if, if bitcoin was 51 percent attack and something like this happened bitcoin the price of bitcoin would, would 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 plummet as a result you know you would be essentially putting all of this infrastructure all of this capital in to kill the network because its whole point it's its whole kind of 13 year reign has been kind of pride on the fact that it's decentralized it's anti-fragile it'll run for decades and so if you were to have someone to come along and conduct an attack like that i personally feel like their only motive would be to basically remove anyone's kind of conviction in it as a network um because as soon as you then try profiteer off it you're trying to profit you know you're trying to earn profit on a network that you've inadvertently killed you know that's essentially kind of my conclusion to it so there's a lot of different kind of areas in which you can try earn, you know, revenue from what you've done, but in doing so, you would have essentially taken down the network that you're trying to profiteer off. So I think that that's kind of what you're getting at there, which is all these different kind of areas you can go into will ultimately be kind of irrelevant because what you've done is is kind of bring the network to an end. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it d definitely is. Um and then like look even still like a 51 like just hypothetically even like someone did get 51 percent for a little while or whatever like it doesn't mean that like you know it's only going to work 51 percent of time for when every 10 minutes so 49 percent of the time it's not even going to be effective and it's going to cost you more and more to keep trying to institute that is, is that correct yeah well the, 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 there's so many different factors you know going on at any given moment whereby you know you're assuming that your 51 percent will stay 51 percent as well you know it, it's not the, the hash rate isn't just a hard and fast figure which is you've seen the way the network has grown for you know x number of months which is you could set out now and you'll say look we need this much capital we need to build a facility this big and then we'll own 51 percent of the network if you did that two years ago when the china ban happened and said look this is the optimal moment for us to 51 percent attack the network because global hash rate has fallen by 50 percent by the time you've gone and done and gone through all those logistical hurdles the network is now doubled in size so your 51 percent is also doubled so this whole kind of idea of, of aiming for a target of getting 51 percent is also logistically very very difficult because what you're seeing at the moment is that from a mining perspective hash rate has just been unrelenting you know every single week to not well on average you're seeing every single um two week period every difficulty adjustment has just been up and up and up and up and up so if you're there trying to plan a network or a 51 percent attack for 18 months to two years time you know you could be working toward a figure that is basically worthless when you actually get to it so i think it's just logistically so so hard to actually make happen yeah, it's exponentially running away from you like <laughs> yeah um, literally, exactly yeah. um so just on this kind of thing like because when you hear 51 percent attacks banded about you talk about you you know you hear it with the mining pools um so like i think there's only like what 10 or 12 big mining pools so people do talk about that but it doesn't take into the account that you can just easily even if now i know i'm kind of really harping on this now but like even if just to clear all doubt <laughs> for anyone listening yeah, yeah. but even if like a mining pool did have a huge amount of hash rate like you can just essentially switch your miner to a different pool can't you like so if you're mining with like slush pool or whatever you can just say oh they're trying to do this i don't i don't agree with that and then you just put it to a different pool yeah, yeah so well so like in, in in those instances the way it would work is that there's one caveat to that which is obviously a pool doesn't need 51 percent of the hash rate to win a block and then deem that block OFAC compliant mm -hmm. you know so they could 
like a manner in which a pool could try to be OFAC compliant is to just the simplest way to do it generally is just include no transactions. So I won't name pools, but if you're whatever pool and you decide, look, we have people breathing in our necks here to be OFAC compliant, we're going to consistently put out block templates that are empty. So then there's no way that we won't be OFAC compliant. But as you said, which is the network in Bitcoin will ultimately dictate the demand for, for anything. So you saw a pool there a couple of weeks ago, which was there was rumors of them halting withdrawals from the pool accounts. Instantly hash rate just dive bombed. I think they, that pool's hash rate halved in something like a week or two or, or less. So I, uh, what you're getting at there, which is there's no kind of dependence on you staying within a pool. As soon as a pool starts demonstrating kind of any kind of bad acting um, or negative connotations around, you know, fungibility or, you know, OFAC compliance or whatever it might be, hash rate can just instantly be diverted somewhere else. So you're not going to set on, on, on staying in any given pool if that if something like that was to materialize. Okay, so just to touch on that, and then we, we can just compare it to Ethereum then, because I, I, my understanding is like, this is a much bigger deal in Ethereum than it is uh, in Bitcoin, like with proof of work. So just on OFAC compliance, um, at the end of the day, it so how, how to explain this now so or how to ask it with time so the bitcoin block subsidy is obviously quite large at the moment like what is it that miners make it's like 95 percent from the block subsidy five percent from fees is that correct roughly like, I, like yeah it's, it's it's the block subsidy is yeah the 99 whatever percent it is it's the majority of it the fees at the moment are essentially minimal in comparison to what the block subsidy is offering you yeah, so my, my understanding here is that it's kind of this is a, another amazing incentive flywheel that's like Satoshi put into Bitcoin that I don't know, was it intentional or not? But with time, it becomes increasingly unprofitable to uh, censor. So say if there's an OFAC compliant pool in 20 years from now and miners are getting 50% of their hash rate from fees and OFAC mm -hmm. are saying that 25% of that uh 50 percent you can't uh interact with because they're not OFAC compliant what that would mean for that 25 percent they'll be willing to pay more and more fees but miners in the pool won't get access to that revenue so they'll be incentivized to switch away from OFAC compliant blocks is that correct yeah essentially what you've kind of summed up is that as the block subsidy withers away you're getting to a stage where beggars can't be choosers, you know, in terms of the, the transactions that they include. So exactly as you said, which is it's almost like a built-in, you know, you know, mechanism in itself, which is if fees themselves are becoming increasingly important for the profitability of a miner, a miner is going to be more and more kind of worried about the fact that any given pool that they're interacting with is censoring transactions and refusing to include them. So as you said, which is if you're in a bear market in one or two cycles time, um, where you have a block reward that's you know low because the price of Bitcoin is isn't quite as representative of the block subsidy, and fees are taking up a lot of your revenue. The last thing you're going to want is someone stepping in and turning half of that revenue away. So as, exactly as you said there, there's this kind of automatic mechanism whereby you know as fees become more and more important, the less kind of likely it is that a miner is going to step in and say, okay, this censoring can go on, and that's where they'll be putting pressures on pools to stop doing what they're doing, or to, as you said earlier they'll just revert away and start sending hash rate to a different pool that isn't partaking in that kind of compliance. Yeah, so I suppose where I'm going with this is like, and what a lot of people fear that because the US mining industry is getting quite large in the US, I think it's like around 30% or it's about that at the moment, is it? Mm -hmm. um, of global uh, hash I think, yeah, they're about, yeah. Yeah, global hash rate is that the US government comes in and says that those miners can only mine OFAC compliant costs <laughs> or blocks. But I suppose... What we just said there was that if 20, 30 years from now, they are trying to do that, geez, we'll be old men then. <laughs> but uh, 20, yeah. 30, 20, well, we won't be, I suppose, but we're getting there. Um, 20, 30 years from now, um, those miners will be taking a massive, like they'll basically be, it'd be a massively anti-competitive it'd be a huge competitive disadvantage for them not being able to access those blocks and it'd be an advantage to miners in jurisdictions that could access those wanted to mine those yeah. blocks. is that correct yeah yeah the only the only caveat i have in mind there though which is as fees become you know better you know greater as the fee representation becomes higher and higher 
essentially what that encourages. And it's something that you're seeing already um, on Ethereum because they have such high fees based on, you know, how much network participation and act activity that they have. You have something called, you know, maximum extractable value. And that's why you have something like Flashbots that comes along in Ethereum, which is almost the encouraging of front running and essentially trying to profit maximize from fees. And so what that brings along is as fees become increasingly important on Bitcoin and what people think is that fees are, are going to be increasingly important for the security of the network, we're hoping that fees are going to continue to increase. But in doing so, as the fee market um, for Bitcoin increases, that will then encourage centralized entities to come along and try profit maximize off of that. And those centralized entities, like the instance for fla flashbots, flashbots, there's kind of a conflict of interest there, which is the search for you know maximal value from transactions will then lead to centralized entities coming along and helping you with that. But they will be the entities that people go to to try implement OFAC compliance, and that's what you're seeing at the moment with um, flashbots and MEV on Ethereum. So basically, flashbots are helping a lot of these operators to maximize their fee revenue, but they're also the ones that are dictating, you know, is this OFAC compliant or not? Um, so you kind of have a small bit of a conflict of interest there, which is we need Bitcoin fees to increase. Well, that's obviously open to interpretation as well, but we might want Bitcoin fees to increase. But as soon as you do that and you start creating a, a fee market, essentially, that's when you start seeing centralized entities getting involved and trying to maximize that market and becoming kind of, an attack vector in themselves, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Uh, to be honest, I don't have a great understanding of MEV. So as he says, maximum extractable value, ex maximum extractable um, value blocks. And I know they're a bigger deal on ETH because it's, it's to do with smart contracts, isn't it? And Bitcoin doesn't have much. Um, well, it's, it's just essentially that there's more value to be extracted from the blocks, given the amount of fees that are going on. So there's more value to be extracted from cherry picking certain transactions and including them to in order to get more revenue. Whereas on Bitcoin, as I said earlier, you know, beggars can't be choosers. There's currently no real market on Bitcoin for trying to extract value from the transaction fees because there isn't a lot of them. You know, on, on, on certain blocks that you might see, you know, there could be the block subsidy is 6.25 Bitcoin and the transaction fee revenue on that block is, you know, 0 0.005, you know, so th there is no real market in trying to extract further value from that. Um, but as that market increases, you know, like any other, you know, open market, that's where people will try and extract value from it. But on, on Ethereum, it's much, much more popular because you have much more fees to essentially work with and have a market for. Um, so that's what you're seeing at the moment, which is something like Flashbots coming along. And I think to the best of my knowledge, they're you know, operating relays that relays that will cherry pick transactions to try and include in order to extract the most value for um, a validator, for example. Okay. And could that be like, so instead of say, could that be kind of perverse somehow? Like could the, it's kind of, I think you kind of already answered, but could the regulator come in or whatever and say um, to those miners then 20, 30 years from now in the US, just hypothetically, um, I know there's a lot of other factors to play here as well, but could they say, could, could they basically pay a premium to the miners for not including transit so that they could say that do not include OFAC and we'll reimburse you for doing so to keep you competitive? Yeah, it's, I, th I think you can, to be honest. Like, you see, the thing is at the moment with, you know, Ethereum, you don't know what's going on in the background, you know, so th you don't really know what the incentive is for someone wanting to include certain transactions. Well, sorry, including other. just to talk, talk about Bitcoin specifically here as opposed to Ethereum. So with regard to someone coming along and saying, you know, include that and kind of breathing down their neck and saying, look, we'll reimburse you if you don't include transactions from here and reaching out to a Bitcoin equivalent of Flashbot, essentially. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, but the, the, there definitely is. Like, so that's, but that's, as I said earlier, which is until the fees increase, there's no kind of incentive for someone to be involved in that market. But as soon as that market emerges, that becomes an attack vector to an extent. You know, that's where you have the complexity. Mm -hmm. So any like anything on Ethereum, I always think of, or anything on any kind of blockchain project, blockchain in quotes, or on Bitcoin, the reason it's the simplicity is better is because as soon as you add more complexity, 
you're increasing the attack vector on on the kind of project as a whole or on the network as a whole and that's just something worth thinking about because no one really knows how this is going to play out and it's kind of why you have people getting involved now talking about the likes of, of stratum v2 etc as you've kind of mentioned before which is giving miners the ability to build the block templates themselves so that's kind of a, a key factor here that people are trying to implement with stratum v2 which is the manner in which blocks are formed so at the moment the pools build the blocks um, and they might be interacting with someone like Flashbox to say, you know, how should we build this for it? Just, just as a very, very simple terms, you know, how should we build this in order to extract the most value? So that currently doesn't exist really on, on Bitcoin at all. There'd be no reason for it to exist. Um, so they, the, the pools at the moment build the block templates. They'll decide what transactions go in. Um, but with something like Stratum V2, what will happen is miners will be able to pick the block template themselves. So you're basically giving the power back to the individual to an extent and then the influence that these centralized entities or someone kind of bringing down the neck of the likes of a flashbots has is a bit more diminished because you could have a, an individual miner that isn't focusing on something like that. You know, they're just building blocks as they should. Um, so all of this is kind of, you know, going on at once. And as you said, when you think about 30 years time, it's always so difficult. You know, we're only kind of 13 years into this. And you're talking about 30 years time to see, you know, how the market will develop and how these kind of mechanisms will change in order to maintain the integrity of the network itself. Yeah, so and that was something I was thinking about yeah, earlier before the call, like Stratton V2, where um, is it like, is there an economic incentive for miners to, to adopt this or is it just kind of purely on a like, this would be better for the network? Yeah, see, that's that's kind of, you know, when you, when you talk about hurdles of kind of Stratum V2, that's kind of one that kind of sticks out in my mind at the moment, which is, as a pool, you know, a kind of key hurdle forward is that as a miner and as individuals and as people who care about the network, we would want it implemented. Um, but as a pool, and if you're thinking long term, you might not want that implemented. And ultimately, it'll be up to the pool to implement Stratum V2. So that is kind of a, you know, a little hurdle there whereby they might be thinking, look, why would I give away this, you know, incentive? Because in 10 years time, you know, managing and constructing blocks ourselves could be a, a key part of, of, of our business, you know, and, in, and a manner in which we can extract value. So that is kind of a, a kind of another conflict of interest there, which is Stratum V2 is definitely better for the network because it helps that whole decentralization aspect, whereby if you're giving, empowering the miner and not the pool, you kind of remove that, that problem. So at the moment, when you think about attack vectors on Bitcoin, really, um, you have the mining infrastructure itself. So you have someone approaching a mining facility and saying, you know, stop, stop doing what you're doing, turn off all your mining facility, or you, you know, you approach the pools in whatever jurisdiction that they're in um, and say cease operations or start being OFAC compliant or we're going to shut you down. Um, and so that's where Stratum V2 is, is pretty important because when you start empowering the miners to essentially almost be like a pool of their own to an extent, you know, you're giving them the ability to build block templates themselves. That takes care of that. And then you're also seeing the decentralization of the hash rate naturally. So you're seeing containerized mining, which is obviously what we do at Skilling, also coming to the fore here across, you know, whether it be farms in Ireland, whether it be oil and gas fields in the US, you're seeing the infrastructure decentralize. And what Stratum V2, I think, will help is you'll start to see the block construction and the block template building decentralized as well. And you're just, all you're trying to do at any given moment, obviously on Bitcoin, is just remove as many attack vectors as you possibly can. Um, and I think Stratum V2 is kind of a right step in, in, in that direction. Mm -hmm. So like, could, could the miners, like, could they get together? Um, like, I suppose on a pro rata basis, so say Skilling got together with like, I don't know, Hot8 and all the other big miners and mm -hmm. said, right, we are now only using Stratum V2, uh, like pools. So the, the first thing, like is, so I suppose, like is there would there be on a pro rata basis so obviously if there's less less hash rate in the pool you're not going to get um like it puts pressure on the pool like liquidity liquidity wise to you know until it starts actually finding blocks but um could like yeah i suppose on a pro rata basis is there any economic benefit because i i suppose my thing here is like is this just something because I, I don't know i'm not in mining is this just something that everyone talks about in bitcoin is this ever really going to come like is there any reason for miners to drive this is what i'm what i'm saying 
Yeah, like I suppose when I first started hearing about, like I was hearing about Stratum V2 when I got into the space, you know, in 2019, like 2020, I was listening to podcasts about it and I was reading about it. Um, and fast forward, you know, basically three years now, slightly more at this point, and, you know, it still hasn't been implemented. Um, so I think it's as you're alluding to, which is, you know, what is the kind of incentive to implement it? Um, like, for instance, I haven't, you know, actively interacted with Stratum V2 myself yet. Um, and I think the kind of next hurdle is is just trying to onboard people in order to, to kind of foresee the pressure that's now building in Ethereum. And I think Ethereum is a good litmus test for, you know, all fact compliance. Because I think ultimately it depends on what the incentives are of the miner themselves. You know, some miners, and you've kind of already seen it already, I think we've spoken, you know, we've spoken about it before, which is some large scale US miners have tried to sneak in stuff, which is, you know, this block is OFAC compliance or this block is green, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and so you might have mining pools saying, look, we're going to implement this because we don't like where the network is heading with stuff like that. Because there are, you know, a number of pools that have their incentives in the right place. And if it's a better thing for the network, and if it's a better thing for the longevity of the industry, then it becomes kind of a no brainer to implement it. But for individuals that, might have misaligned incentives and would prefer to be following along in this kind of concept of, of OFAC compliance and, and doing what they're told, then they have you know different incentives to a pool that's been running for 13 years and are focused on the longevity of the network. So I think it'll be very interesting to see you know what are the incentives that emerge for people to implement Stratum V2. Um, but ultimately, I, th I think it will come in. I, I, I don't know when, but I think when you look at the kind of future trajectory of the network, it's something that's very, very important. I think kind of that's what will be the kind of critical factor here, which is why would you shoot yourself in the foot by being greedy over something like this when this could be the kind of thing that ensures the network keeps going for longer? Yeah, I'm going to have to do a Stratum V2 deep dive after this now. <laughs> um, There's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. And I think, you know, even myself, I, I do my best to try to keep up with everything like this. But I think as we've talked about before, you try your best as an individual, but you know the reason you're not sat over there with all of these guys building Stratum V2 is because you're not, you know, you're not a backend developer. You know, you don't have the the C plus plus or, or the or the programming skills to do it. So all you kind of can do is try to keep up, um, and kind of what they are signaling is just as a, as a miner is just read up on it and try to show your support because it is going to be something that's you know pretty integral to keeping things going. Yeah, we'll have to send Jordan over. <laughs> yeah, def I'll definitely he's the man to go. Um, so, okay, so then just like uh, proof of stake then, um, like what's, how would you, like we touched on mining, like proof of work, how would you explain proof of stake? Like how does it compare? Yeah, well, so essentially in, in my mind, proof of stake, well, what it is, is just you're taking a, uh, a monetary value of Ethereum and you're, and you're locking it up in order to become a validator that will give you, you know, a method to, you know, construct blocks and participate in the network. So in, in, in mining and Bitcoin, um, your skin in the game is essentially your, your miner, it's your energy, it's your, your infrastructure, um, but your skin in the game in Ethereum, um, or on, sorry, proof of stake, is the Ethereum that you lock up and that's what encourages you to participate um, in the correct manner, and that's Ethereum's civil mechanism to an extent. So you lock up Ethereum, that encourages you to behave in the correct way. If you don't behave in the correct way, other validator nodes in the network will essentially slash your, your state contribution. Um, and so that's the manner in which they ensure that you're behaving in the correct manner and constructing blocks as you should. Um, so that's kind of what they've come up with now. They've swapped away from proof of work and the mining process, and they've gone on to this proof of stake concept, which is contributing tokens, locking them up, and then getting slashed if you don't behave in the correct manner. And that's how they maintain the integrity of their chain of truth now these days. Yeah, so my understanding the problem, so just talk around OFAC compliance with proof of work versus proof of stake, like my understanding is proof of work is far more robust, like in uh, censorship resistance. Um, and it's, it's basically just down to the idea that now, well, if you take the proof of stake side of things that the miners, like central, not miners, the exchanges, like other centralized entities, are gaining more and more um, proportion of the total stake in the network. So they decide how transactions, how blocks are constructed, etc., how they're validated. Um, and then the big problem with this is, as they get more and more, the regulators are going to start regulating the big institutions directly. 
because it's who has the money makes the rules in Ethereum, basically. And if ex exchanges have the money, um, they make the rules. Is that a correct kind of synopsis? Might be a bit basic, but of the whole. Thing. Yeah, no, I, I think you've you've kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, we already talked about you know minor you know maximum extractable value and how their fee structure essentially encourages them to reach out to centralized entities to you know maximize value, which are then in turn you know contributing to this problem of OFAC compliance. And then on a higher level, as you said, which is the more Ethereum that you have, the more stake you can you know gather, and as a result, then you become a greater point of failure. But I suppose the kind of problem then is because you're then receiving rewards based on your stake, it's ultimately just compounding the issue. So you know, I think that kind of a big problem that I have in my mind is that, of course, we know that you know Ethereum was pre-mined in that the way they kind of spun up the kind of supply of Ethereum and, and distributed it out was almost done kind of on a, a VC structure. Um, but irrespective of all of that, you know, I think that proof of work actually was working in their favor, you know, based on that start that they had. So when people used to give out about Ethereum being free mined and allocated to certain funds and certain individuals, I thought proof of work was, I thought they were lucky that they were on proof of work because it was almost, you know, taking the power away from those individuals. So, you know, you could get a GPU, you could start mining and you could earn the reward. But what I worry about now is that you've essentially put those people back in the driver's seat because now it's back to this concept of, you know, how much tokens you have. And that dictates, as you alluded to earlier, which is the more money you have, the more stake you can buy up, which essentially is just a, a shareholder you know, aspect. It's like going back to the kind of traditional finance um, business structure, which I think kind of works against them. And I think another kind of problem that I've seen, and you know, people probably might, might argue against this, I'm not sure, but because it's becoming increasingly difficult, you know, to become a validator. So you need your 32 Ethereum or, you know, you need the technical ability to spin up a validator node. You're just deciding, look, I'll give it to an institution and I'll let them delegate it for me. And I'll let the likes of, you know, a number of exchanges do it on my behalf. That's again, just contributing to the problem. Whereas on, at the moment on proof of work, if you want to go and buy, you know, an S9 for $150 or $100, you plug it into the wall, you connect to a pool. Um, and you're up and running and you're contributing to the kind of civil mechanism of, of, of the Bitcoin network. Um, so I think the kind of more barriers to entry that you have in order to contribute to the network adds to the problem of decentralization, which I think could be kind of a, a slippery slope that's that's now been started on Ethereum. And as you said, the more centralized entities that you have, the more stake that they acquire, the more that they'll ultimately start to get in rewards and the issue compounds. And then as you alluded to earlier, it becomes easier and easier to kind of pinpoint someone and say, look, this is a, a regulated exchange in the US. They own this amount of stake um, in the network. Then that's who we're going to go after. So, you know, it, it's, it's definitely a problem. And I don't quite see how they stop that slippery slope of, of compliance and stake ultimately coming into the hands of, of the wrong people to an extent. Not the wrong people, because there's no kind of, I'm, you're almost insinuating them that they're trying to do wrong. But when you look at the incentives of, of a network, you know, OFAC compliance shouldn't be top of the list. And at the moment, you are seeing quite a number, a lot of, you know, a big number of blocks falling under that. So I'm not too sure how they stop that. Yeah, I suppose which way it's trending, like, but um, Bitcoin's trend towards more decentralization and ETH is just creeping the other way. So, but like exactly what you said there, though, um, just on the last point, like the exchanges in the US getting closer to. Well, just if you get close to proof of stake with the big exchanges like regulators and all that, like Brian Armstrong, uh, the CEO of Coinbase, he was tweeting that someone asked him this on Twitter, like what would if the regulator went to Coinbase and said that they have to implement um, OFAC compliance on what blocks they're validating. And um, he basically said that what they would do, I think it, paraphrasing now, but he basically said something like he he wouldn't allow that to happen um it, because but, they just they just wouldn't do it they cancel their product but then i i was thinking like well you have a fiduciary obligation to your shareholders to generate the most money as possible this is going to be a massive revenue line so the board is just going to remove him from his position as ceo if he chose to do that so if if that's like eve's protection against censorship resistance which is brian armstrong saying he's not going to do it like it's a bit worrying yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, but I, I... Exactly. And I think it just goes back to the incentive structure of proof of stake now, which is exactly as you said, which is 
it's it's the money that matters you know what i mean that that's kind of the key thing here it's the money that dictates you know what goes on and shareholders are not going to go along with something like that if you're a publicly listed company and you're using flashbots you're getting as much money as you possibly can and you're using flashbots to extract as much value from the process and then they're also operating under OFAC compliance you know there's not really much that an individual in this instance can do you know to an extent so i think Come out and saying that that, that you're going to stop that, as you literally, as you said, if you have a group of shareholders that are saying, "Look, this is becoming a massive income stream for us," you know, being a validator in this instance, we're generating this much revenue a year. It's consistent. They're just going to go. In my opinion, I think they're just going to go I'll go along with that. And I think there's very little way to stop them, um, because I think you are in a slippery slope whereby allowing monetary value to dictate how much ownership you have over the network is is definitely a problem you know so i think a, a, an example you mentioned earlier very very briefly is the block size wars in that individuals for right or wrong reasons wanted to bring the bitcoin network in a certain direction but you had that kind of disparity between miners um that had you know a lot of hash rate you had exchanges and you had some really kind of og individuals that had a lot of coins um but they had no you know power over the network itself they want to, you know integrate bigger block sizes but nodes without any kind of financial incentive or relevance to how much you know bitcoin they own themselves were able to say you know we're not going to implement that but with this kind of soft proof of stake you've essentially just jumbled everything together so you've combined miners you've combined nodes you've combined civil and civil mechanisms and consensus mechanisms together all into one whereby now individuals that essentially have the most money and have the most kind of holdings in that network can now dictate where the network goes, um, which is the problem. The problem there is, you know, as incentives become misaligned and you have people then swinging the power around saying, look, we have the most tokens so we can dictate where things go, irrespective of how this kind of affects this, the little guy in this network, that's where we're headed and there's not really much you can do about it. Um, so I kind of think that's a, you know, a massive problem of proof of stake as you alluded to, because, no matter what the kind of single intentions of one individual in a company, you know, if you even translate it to a single, you know, individual in the network, ultimately it's not going to matter because to an extent it's, it's, it's the money talks in this instance, which I think is, is, is a bit of a problem. Yeah. And I suppose like it's exactly, um, I think you're spot on there, but I, I think it's worth mentioning as well, though, that like, just in case some people misinterpret the argument here, like, Oh, well, I'm definitely not saying, and I don't think you are either, Max, that like OFAC compliance in itself is actually um, like say we're not making any statement as to whether it's a good or bad thing. No, <laughs> could go into that, but maybe for a different time. <laughs> but um, the point is that like if Bitcoin is to remain a neutral network, like proof of work is absolutely fundamental in being a neutral and a political money whereas like ethereum with this incentive mechanism is going to trend more and more towards a highly politicized money um which you know i think most people would agree that it's not good for freedom not good for little guy um and it's not why we were all here in bitcoin in the first place um or like be believing in the fundamentals of the space um i take it you'd agree with that or because <laughs> i spoke for you there <laughs> no yeah well I, exactly as, as you said i just think that it, the whole point of what we're doing is just decentralization anyway which is even if you take away kind of what you mentioned there which is you know what is the purpose of a network you know in itself you know is it money is it you know composability and smart contracts um and who dictates where that network goes and i think looking back on the block size wars was a massive win for the small guy you know in bitcoin whereby irrespective of how much wealth or how much coins certain individuals had, they had no power over the network. They couldn't get something through that some of the big exchanges wanted, some of the you know really kind of early adopters of Bitcoin wanted because the little guy was able to say, no, that's not where we're headed. But I think the problem is, is that if, if, if incentives, as I said earlier, become misaligned on Ethereum, you start to wonder, you know, where is that network headed? So you're kind of in a funny situation now whereby People on Ethereum are talking about are talking about sharding, you know. So you're talking about a new incentive structure that will be the next step, and that the current individuals that are partaking in the network might want sharding to go. But I don't know if people, you know, how how much kind of understanding people have of sharding. But a sharding will.
percent whereby it depends on how the biggest stakers or the biggest holders want it to go. So sharding will essentially destroy smart contracts to the best of my knowledge on Ethereum. Um, but if that's where the largest stakers want it to go, that's where it'll go. And if that's where it does go, sharding focuses on scalability and then you're trying to compete as a money. So you've lost your, your smart contract composability feature. Now you're trying to compete as money, which means you're competing with Bitcoin. And now you're a centralized version of money. So you're just like anything else. So I, I, you know, I, I just think the problem is that in becoming more centralized, you're getting in a tug of war, you know, whereby individuals that might have misaligned incentives can just start dragging the network in a direction that, you know, the small guy might not want it to go. Um, and I, like in my mind, it's, it's, I think that's quite difficult to stop. Yeah, keep keep it simple, stupid. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it, 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 as the more the more complexity that you add, as I said earlier, the more you open up attack vectors, you know, to the network itself. And I think the, the, that one of of sharding for me is something that I'm that I'm focusing on quite a bit on Ethereum, which is if something like that is implemented, and just for a very brief explainer of, of sharding, essentially is almost like creating you know multiple ledgers on the same network. And the problem is that it you have smart the reason it kills smart contracts is that it affects composability which means if something executes on one of those ledgers it can't interact with a ledger elsewhere and so that whole kind of mechanism of operating smart contracts completely falls apart um but there is talk of pushing ethereum in that direction and i think that's an, an issue with as you alluded to which is you need to just keep it simple because as soon as you start having these kind of internal tug of wars that's where things get messy and i think at least Bitcoin focuses on simplicity, and if you focus on simplicity, longevity, anti-fragility, that's how you get you know a network that sticks, you know, stays together. And that's where I can you know sit here and think, look, I think Bitcoin is going to be here in three decades' time because as much as we keep it simple, it's you know anti-fragile, and that's kind of the most important thing, you know, in, in my mind anyway. Yeah, hundred um, percent. So, like, j just to touch on Mark, um, like say bitcoin and saving the planet and stuff like that um now i would never i think you could argue this on a number of different levels i i would actually make the argument that even if you're just buying into the whole climate stuff um that bitcoin is actually worth whatever energy it did cost even if it wasn't uh good for the climate per se because of the benefits it would bring to humanity now that that that's the that's kind of the high level view i take now having said that i appreciate the fact that bitcoin can also absolutely crush the other argument to say that it actually makes a huge difference in incentivizing green and clean tech uh, energy all over the world and like you gave an amazing talk like for anyone that wants to uh look it up if you look up uh, can bitcoin help save the planet bitcoin collective in edinburgh mark did a talk with a, a few other bitcoiners on the stage and it's just brilliant around this um but like if you want to talk uh mark just a little bit around like bitcoin and energy usage and how even though it's portrayed the media as being totally dirty um and very bad for the environment how this isn't really the case yeah, well, so like kind of simple facts, just kick things off is that people like to make kind of crude comparisons of, of Bitcoin's energy use versus nations and whatever it might be. So like the simplest kind of facts and figures kick things off, which is that the Bitcoin network in itself uses less than, you know, 1% of, of the global energy um, consumption, which, you know, you wouldn't, you think would be a lot, lot higher based on, on some of the articles that you see. But I think kind of the biggest problem with the whole Bitcoin and energy argument is that people obsess over the total consumption of a network, um, as opposed to kind of asking themselves, how can the strategic and innovative use of energy consumption bring about a net positive? So I think it, regard, Bitcoin aside at the moment, there's a constant negative narrative around Bitcoin or energy consumption, um, assuming that if you're consuming energy, then you're, you're having a negative effect somewhere. Um, but what Bitcoin mining is showing is that this is basically a location agnostic energy consumer. It can consume energy where any other process can't. Um, and what that allows you to do is to reduce methane emissions. And how that actually happens is that in a lot of instances, 
there's a lack of financial incentive to consume energy in a certain location and consume methane in a certain location. And what Bitcoin mining does, it becomes it comes along and it acts as that perfect constant off grid buyer. Um, and so what you're seeing at the moment is that in in America, for example, Bitcoin miners are co-locating themselves on oil and gas fields and they're consuming methane that would otherwise be flared. Um, and kind of long story short, to kind of come back around to your question, which is methane mining or methane reduction mining is becoming increasingly popular um, because Bitcoin mining as a whole um, searches for the cheapest and most you know innovative um, energy solutions it possibly can, which is forcing miners to go to the cheapest energy on the planet, which is energy that would otherwise be wasted. Um, and if this kind of whole industry of methane capture mining continues, it's highly possible that we could have you know a carbon negative Bitcoin network by the middle of this decade, whereby Bitcoin mining as an industry is consuming and reducing more emissions than it's actually emitting. Um, but I think it just goes back to, you know, another key question here, which is, you know, is Bitcoin mining worth it, which is a more Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoiner focused conversation. But I think the biggest problem with it at the moment is that it's its its a single biggest attack vector. So a lot of the traditional media, let's say, irrespective of what it's used for and, and if it's useful or not, it uses too much energy, which is just a very kind of narrow minded statement, which is, you know, it uses too much energy. It's just way too broad of a, of a kind of statement to come out with, whereby they don't, you know, differentiate between on-grid sites. They don't differentiate between off-grid sites. They don't differentiate between um, methane reduction mining sites. They lump it all into one and they just assume that all that consumption is negative. Um, and all the way, to, I'm pretty sure the way that they come up with these transactions or these kind of figures is they say, look, how much hash rate is there globally? How much is that probably consuming? That's what it, that's what it's consuming. And they don't go out and do any kind of research. They don't do any studies to see, you know, how many oil and gas off-grid miners are there? How many on-grid miners are there? What are they doing in Ireland? What are they doing in Wyoming? You know, what are they doing in Kenya with gridless? They just put it all under one big blanket term. Um, and that's the problem is, is that they're the articles that people read. Um, and another kind of massive problem is that they do these calculations whereby they say, how much hash rate is there? Okay, that must be consuming that much electricity. And that much electricity translates to this much emissions. And they don't even you know, look at the back end of what sources of energy a lot of these sites are using. Um, and so that's where you see the, you know, the really ridiculous headlines um, of comparing, you know, Bitcoin energy use to countries and then saying that that translates to X amount of CO2. Um, and another really kind of annoying narrative is they relate it to transactions. So we won't know that. And as we mentioned earlier, um, maybe people didn't you know, realize this when we mentioned it, but Bitcoin transactions are actually embedded in the blocks themselves. So when a new block appears and it gets mined and a miner guesses or a machine guesses the, uh, the correct code and allow it to be added, all the transactions that were included in that block are added. They're not separate from that. So you can, you can mine an empty block, but what a lot of these kind of facts and figures try to do is they take the global you know, emissions in quotes that they've calculated, then they calculate how many transactions have occurred and they try in, in, and, and kind of lead people on to think that when me and you send Bitcoin back and forth, that that emits a certain amount of CO2. And they never once try to you know, mention that that block was going to be mined regardless and that the transactions were actually embedded in the block that was mined regardless. And so a transaction between myself and yourself didn't emit any extra CO2 at all. Like that, all that narrative is, is just completely false. Um, and another one that I've seen the whole time as well is people like Digiconomist saying that ASIC machines, sorry, I'm kind of going on a, a bit of a spiel here to go through all the kind of stuff I see because it's just, it's, it's, it's tough to read, but they insinuate that uh, these ASIC machines or the miners, the mining machines have a lifespan of two years um, because they basically try to translate it to any other technology. And so without doing any research, they say that, look, this machine runs for two years and then essentially it gets thrown in the ocean and it's never used again. And that translates to X amount of e-waste per transaction. You know, this is how they do the figures and try to relate them to themselves. But the, the machines themselves don't die after two years. It's all based on the profitability and the strategic use of the machines. And I think the best example that I always go back to is that you have the S9, which was a machine created in 2016, um, and it's still running 
on oil and gas fields seven years later. You know, it, 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 because all that matters is how much Bitcoin do you get out and how, what's your electricity cost? So if your electricity cost is zero because you're running off of stranded methane that would have otherwise been flared, you will run that machine until it won't run anymore because anything greater than zero is better than what you're getting anyway. Um, and I think that's something that, that that's so often overlooked. And I think especially as intermittent mining and renewable mining increases in popularity, you'll have machines that go from high uptime sites, which is you know 99% uptime sites, which might be biogas, or in some instances, it could be you know methane reduction sites. Um, as soon as those machines get older and older and slightly less profitable, I think they'll be pushed to soakage sites, whereby they might sit on a wind farm and only boot up 30 or 40 percent of the time when prices go negative on that wind farm which just to kind of go back to the point i'm arguing their lifespan could be eight or nine years as intermittent machines or soaked site machines and so these figures of you know two years and we all dump our machines and move on to the next best thing are just ridiculous and i think they they, they just need to be kind of evaluated and you need to have someone that will come along and say you know all those facts and figures are warped just to say the least yeah, that, that's all really excellent points. Um, and just just on what you said there, the um, the, the fact that Bitcoin could actually go carbon negative, i.e., could be better, all its consumption could be better for the environment than not being so for the environment. I suppose to drill down that a bit more, it's basically because there's a cost um, to the environment associated with producing some types of en energy, like oil and gas flaring where there's a huge environmental cost. It's flared into the atmosphere to get the gas out the ground and Bitcoin can capture that yep. and totally use that energy. And then that energy otherwise, that that um, pollution otherwise doesn't go up into the air, which is where the negative energy, um, uh, the negative, what carbon output uh, comes yeah. from. Essentially, Bitcoin mining is the buyer of energy. It's the buyer of last resort. So it's the buyer of energy when no one else wants to be the buyer of that energy. Um, and then it's inadvertently the catalyst for methane reduction, as, as you literally just said, which is if you just send methane up into the atmosphere, or you flare it off. I think flares are only 91% efficient. So when you actually flare off gas, or essentially you burn it up into the atmosphere, it doesn't always burn off of that all of the gas because of wind or whatever it might be. Um, and when methane goes into the atmosphere, it's 80 times more harmful than, than CO2. And so what Bitcoin mining is doing is it's be, being that financial incentive to put a generator in place, convert methane to CO2, lead, you know, create that 80 time reduction in, in methane emissions, you know, when you compare them um, as equivalents. Um, and it's acting as that constant off-grid buyer of last resort. You know, people, I, the really good phrase is that these guys are unfussy eaters of energy they'll go anywhere in the world you can face them location agnostically and they will consume gas um, or energy in any location that, that that's needed and the studies that are being done um, are very specifically on you know landfills so landfills around the world flare gas because it's a buildup of methane um, as the waste decomposes and obviously oil and gas fields that have to flare at the moment as well um, and people, what people are saying is that if, if methane reduction mining continues on the trajectory that it's on, we'll be consuming more methane and you know reducing more carbon than other participants in the industry are are, are putting out. Um, and exactly as I said earlier, it will basically be a, a carbon negative network by then, and will be you know undoubtedly um, a net positive for the environment, which is a kind of narrative and it's a kind of concept that people find extremely extremely difficult to understand because i think people ultimately think that any mining farm around the world kind of has a, a chimney at the top of it that's emitting black smoke out into the atmosphere and making you know you know a, a seriously harmful effect and not realizing that the strategic and innovative use of this location agnostic fire can lead to a net positive yeah, and I suppose like it's as well like the reason these things are going to become so popular and are becoming so popular is because would it be correct to say that like the 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 flaring associated so if Bitcoin mining could capture the gas or methane that's flared, um, that would if it almost have a negative energy price because they'd have to pay fines and stuff associated with their carbon pollution. Is that correct? Yeah, well, so th I think at the moment that's that's definitely a part of it. And I think those fines will gradually get worse. Um, so Bitcoin mining is a really interesting model in that it's almost providing 
a revenue stream for gas that you thought was going to cost you money. So it's flipping a cost into a revenue stream. So in my mind as well, it's, it's encouraging this rollout at a much, much faster pace. So if you have to wait for people to be fined for this to be corrected, in my mind, it will certainly take a lot, lot longer for it to be corrected than someone come al- coming along to you and saying, we can turn that into money. You know, that's a, you know, a crude kind of, kind of way to phrase it, but it's a lot, lot faster to come along to someone and say, look, this is going to provide a net positive and a revenue stream to something that will inadvertently be costing you money in months or years to come. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer for, for landfills and oil and gas fields to implement something like this. Yeah, okay. So, look, this is coming full circle then to, um, like, you guys are working directly in this industry. Um, you have a big uh, anaerobic digestion operation up the north of Ireland. Um, yeah, what's the story of all that then? So, how are you? So, this is even, I suppose, this is different to flaring again from like gas and all that. What, how are you guys doing? What's different about this compared to flaring? And like, what are you doing up there? Yeah, so there's kind of a number of models that, that we've kind of found as we've built the business over the kind of past two years. Kind of simplest model being is that you'll have biodigesters or anaerobic digesters in place um, that will be exporting to the grid, for example. Um, and over the course of their lifespan, there might have been you know a number of instances whereby someone could come along and say, can you take this waste? And a, an anaerobic digester will say, look, or an anaerobic digestive plant owner will say, I can only export, I can only export X amount. There's never any incentive for me to produce more energy than I can export. And um, what Bitcoin mining does is it can come along and now bolt onto that energy asset and provide a constant awkward buyer. Um, so in this particular instance, it's just offering them, you know, a faster payback to their renewable asset that will then obviously allow them to go on and invest in further anaerobic digestion sites or whatever it might be. Um, but where it kind of gets into the nitty gritty of the methane reduction side of things is that Bitcoin mining could be the catalyst for a great agnostic rollout of anaerobic digestion in Ireland. So what that actually means kind of in simple terms is that there could be strategic areas whereby an anaerobic digester or a biodigestion plant would be perfect given the amount of waste that is available in a certain area. Um, but the grid could come along and say, look, it could be three or four years before your grid connected. Um, and even when that happens, you know, you'll only be able to export half of what you're planning to produce. Um, and so there could be an instance whereby that anaerobic digester or biodigester plant might have to move to a different location um, or it might just not make it to market at all. Um, and what I'm trying to demonstrate and what we're trying to demonstrate in here is that essentially what Bitcoin mining can be is that location agnostic buyer of energy for an off-grid AD plant. So if it makes sense or if the grid is hindering the rollout of a methane reduction technology like biodigestion because it's not allowing them to onboard the energy that they could create, Bitcoin, mi- Bitcoin mining can come along and be the catalyst for faster rollout of this technology. So what it'll essentially allow is, it'll allow you to locate biodigestion plants where it makes most strategic sense to consume as much waste as you possibly can and will essentially make it you know, grid agnostic. Um, and as I said earlier, it could be a case of mining small scale completely off grid you know, with a small um, biodigestion plant, um, or it could just be a case of, again, being a bolt-on. So you could have a site that farmers in the area, or there could be, you know, a dairy processing plant, or whatever it might be, um, could contribute enough waste to an anaerobic digestion plant to produce a megawatt. Um, But the grid might come along and say, look, you can only export 750. Um, And so instead of these plants having to either take in less waste, um, which will obviously have to be disposed of elsewhere, they can now go ahead and say, well, look, we'll take as much waste as we possibly can because we have this off-grid buyer for it anyway. And so they'll continue exporting as normal, and then they'll be Bitcoin will just be an anchor tenant, um, as Obi kind of described before in that talk with regard to gridless compute. It's something that people assume won't apply to Ireland, but it really does in that this whole concept of off-grid anchor tenants would be a really kind of integral part in my mind for the financial economics of these sites stacking up um, as you look towards the rollout. So Ireland has a plan now, which is really good news that they announced in the past couple of weeks, which is we plan to build 130 um, anaerobic digestion plants across Ireland. Um, But in my mind, the last thing you want is grid connections hindering the pace of that rollout. 
um, or the amount that or the amount of energy that these things could produce or the kind of financial economics of them and what Bitcoin mining could do is make that roll out you know grid and location agnostic um, so I think there's definitely kind of a market for it being an energy asset bolt on as well as just being the only buyer of energy in in isolated or rural locations yeah so what you're saying there basically you you could say to whoever's in charge that rollout look you guys don't even need to think about because they're doing it for environmental reasons here in ireland like so it's um yeah it's a mix exactly yeah yeah so there you, you could say to them, look you guys don't even need to bother about uh connecting to the grid we could just get these mining operations all over ireland and then that will gobble up all the electri electricity and then it reduce the emissions um from methane as with the anaerobic digestion process yeah exactly so you, all you want to do and in my mind is just take away as many kind of barriers to entry as possible for these plants um and i think you know when i've spoken to people about smaller scale anaerobic pro, you know plants um you know kind of 50 to 100 kilowatts um it is the kind of interaction with the grid system that can be quite a hindrance for either finding a buyer for the energy so a key part of the payback is your ability to export and if you're told it's going to be a long number of years before you can export you're just not going to go ahead with the with the implementation of that plant which means you waste continues to be spread on land on farms around the country whatever it might be um, and so in my mind bitcoin mining here is just a catalyst to make that rollout more efficient whether it be on the larger scale model you know off taking energy that can't be exported and making the payback you know faster for these individuals um or it could be you know a really key factor whereby it could be the you know the kind of make or break between a you know a plant making it to a certain location or not um and ultimately you want to make the life of, of kind of the farmers just take farmers as an example here as easy as possible because if the rollout of biogas plants is limited to um the grid system that ultimately leads to you know, going back to bitcoin here centralization whereby you might be asking farmers or individuals to travel a certain distance that's you know quite a big distance in order to provide waste to this plant um in order to you know generate electricity but of course the process of bringing that waste from one location to that centralized plant also emits emissions as well so you don't want people traveling you know just take an example two hours with a truck to put waste into an ad plant because then that's also emitting emissions in itself you want to strategically locate these plants in the areas where it makes most sense to consume as much waste as possible um, and also reduce emissions as much as you possibly can yeah that's really insightful so and it, look there's even more benefits that we could i suppose we talk for hours on this stuff really but um you could talk about like uh like there's load balancing on the grid um all that kind of stuff and then there's like you know there might be potential for so someone was talking to me about this recently they they said like you could you now i'd said logistics this are absolute nightmare um wouldn't work very easily but just the the example of stands um and i'm not sure how viable it would be maybe one day but like you could hypothetically put the empire state building you could cover it with solar panels you could put bitcoin miners then in the basement and you could heat the heat the whole building from the solar panels and have and have bitcoin output as well like at the end of the day um is that something like that possible or is that totally crazy talk well like it's, it's definitely possible but i think something that like something that's interesting there that like that you were kind of mentioning earlier as well um is this kind of idea of, of load balancing it's something kind of worth mentioning whereby i've had people say to me look you know you can't do this here because you're going to take energy from the grid that could be used elsewhere and you know you're just going to be kind of a net negative for for people elsewhere um but kind of a key part of the mining industry and it's something that the eu is is really really missing in their whole kind of understanding of the market so let's go back to the example i gave earlier which is you have an anaerobic digestion plant that at the moment exports 500 kilowatts they get offered more waste and that, that allows them to ramp up to 700 kilowatts so what they do is they reach out to skilling we put in a container and we sit there happily consuming the extra 200 kilowatts for however long but, let's say that the grid does improve over the course of the four or five years that we're running and now they can export the full 700 what bitcoin mining does then is it essentially becomes a controllable load resource um, and so instead of being on 99 percent of the time like we were 
will essentially become a profit maximizing strategy for the AD plants, whereby they will cycle between mining and exporting um, when the grid needs it or doesn't need it. And so you'll essentially get paid to be, it's called a grid ancillary. So mining will operate, you know, during the night, you know, from 11 p.m. till 8 a.m. in the morning. If the grid needs the energy, you'll shut off, you'll like sell that energy back to the grid. The AD plants will then be arbitraging the cost that the grid is willing to provide and the revenue that the miners are able to provide. And I think what some people don't realize is that in reality, mining, especially in Ireland with the price of on-grid electricity, will never, ever, ever be able to compete with the price of on-grid electricity. Um, and as a result of that, it isn't you know, something that will cause you know, negatives on the grid. So the EU at the, came out recently um, and essentially said, look, we're thinking of banning mining in the EU because we need to free up energy um, in order to provide it back to the grid. Or the, the, I think the narrative they said is Bitcoin mining is, is using too much on-grid electricity in Europe. Right. That was what they kind of put the narrative out there. And that's a lot of articles that I saw. But in reality, mining needs the cheapest electricity on the planet. And so mining will never, ever, ever be able to compete with a grid system like in Europe. So people are saying, look, we're going to step in um, and we're going to say that miners must turn off because there's such an energy crunch in Europe at the moment. But anyone who has any understanding of mining knows that a miner will shut off at five or six cents a kilowatt hour. And the price is, you know, the average price of electricity across Europe is at minimum, you know, 12 plus. And so miners will be long gone before there's any kind of com competitive nature occurring between miners consuming and the grid needing the energy because it just doesn't stack up. So mining is one of the most competitive industries in the world. The last thing you need is someone to try step in and interact with that market and tell people to turn off because by the time you knock on the door and say to a miner, you need to turn off you know, the grid needs the energy, that miner was turned off, you know, weeks before. And I think that's what you're seeing in, our, in, in Europe, which is them trying to blame, somehow trying to blame Bitcoin mining, um, but with prices at, you know, 20 cents a kilowatt hour plus, there literally isn't a soul that would be mining on, on the grid system. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to tell people as well, which is they're saying, oh, well, will you turn off? You know, you'll probably refuse to turn off when the grid improves. Um, and, and essentially my logic is, no, we won't. You know. Bitcoin mining is kind of the perfect ancillary for the grid. It will switch off as soon as the grid needs it because what the grid needing it means is that there'll be an increase in price. And as soon as that increase in price materializes, any AD plant that can export the energy instead of mining is just going to shut the mining off and send it back. You know, So I think it, Bitcoin mining has a harmonious relationship with energy grids and energy systems, not a negative relationship. Um, and I think that whole narrative it's getting particularly bad now again coming into the winter in Europe, whereby the EU is trying to say, look, we're going to we're going to ban proof of work mining to kind of free up on with electricity. You have every single miner around the world thinking, God, their prices is the last places I'd go to mine. Um, but they don't quite get that. And so I think that'll be kind of a pretty important thing for us in here to be demonstrating and explaining to people as well. 100 percent. We'll have to get you on like Euro news or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well like it, it's interesting it's also, like the interesting one like the kind of funniest part for me about that as well is that obviously i was in strasbourg a couple of weeks ago talking to members of parliament about this and you know they the, the kind of frustrating thing for me is that they did get it you know they they were they were nodding and saying okay i actually get your point around the price of electricity and how it's a hugely competitive market and that general price of electricity will push out mining naturally and that off-grid mining is a net positive to emissions and then fast forward three weeks and the article came out saying you know the eu is pushing ahead with its plan to it's not even ban proof of work now the wording has slightly changed they are kind of saying look we're just going to ask people to switch off when you know the price of electricity if it gets too high and you know as i said earlier the mining market will naturally regulate itself because it's the most competitive market in the world the last thing they need to do is step in and, and you're already seeing you know the really really kind of tough articles to read which is the eu plans to support you know better energy uh proof of proof of work systems like proof of stake you know and we're going to support proof of stake systems because you know they reduced their carbon footprint by 99.99 percent when they got rid of the mining process but you talk to anyone you know that has a good understanding of, of gpu mining and the vast majority of those those, those miners that were mar mining ethereum went straight to mining you know something else or, or doing a different process so this kind of whole emissions reduction and, and energy reduction that you know ethereum's talk about 
didn't actually materialize. Um, and as I said, as we've literally already discussed, if Bitcoin mining can go carbon negative in the next three or four years and be a net positive, then I think they're going to kind of really struggle to have a leg to stand on, you know, with that argument. You know, how can you come along and say something that's reducing emissions is something that needs to be banned? So, you know, it, it's good to see that we're moving in that direction as well. Not because I really think it matters, but I think it's because it removes attack vectors against the network itself, which I think is, you know, an important thing that we should be looking at as well. Yeah, it's just, I suppose, it's political posturing combined with like the state attack as well that's starting to build. So, yeah, look, it's great stuff. Keep, keep trying to. And, and do you think, like, I, I suppose, do you think it is worth talking to them? Like, um, there is, I, like, lobbying, like, it is obviously beneficial. Do you think it could be an effective mechanism? Yeah, I think I definitely think it's it's worthwhile, you know, because it would be a shame if if you had to overcome if you knew the kind of benefits that Bitcoin mining could bring, um, and you saw a kind of ban or negative connotations constantly being spun up, um, and I think like a lot of the reactions that I saw was it uses too much energy, you know that that line I'm seeing it in the newspapers and then I'm seeing them repeat it to me back, you know, again because that's what they're being told and that they mm -hmm. think that any form of mining has to be in a large data center that consumes energy 24 7 and it's nothing but negative negative. and so when i was able to bring up a video and show them a video of our container running on a farm you know in armagh they did said oh i didn't realize that you could stick a couple of machines in a small box and consume whatever energy is available you know they were thinking i assume that it had to be at least you know 10 megawatts it had to be a big data center i didn't realize that you could strategically locate Bitcoin mining, you know, operations. And that's literally what this entire, you know, carbon negative movement is and oil and gas mining and landfill mining. It's the strategic use of this consumption whereby you can stick in 120 kilowatts and it will consume all of that energy no matter where you put it. Um, and so I think that's, that's you know, an, an important step, which is I definitely think it's worthwhile, to be honest. I think not doing it is just kind of letting all the positive steps that we're making go to waste. Um, and even when I apply it to kind of an Irish example, which is you have Irish, you know, data centers copying quite a lot of stick at the moment for their on-grid consumption and that they're, you know, always consuming um, when other people are struggling for energy and energy prices are going up. And I think that's the kind of key defining factor between Bitcoin mining um, and those kind of data centers is that Bitcoin mining is a perfectly interruptible process and a lot of these traditional data centers aren't. So you'll see announcements whereby a data center will say they're being built in the outer Dublin area. You know, they're contributing funding to a nearby wind farm and they're going green, you know, and they're making a net, you know, they're, they're facilitating the onboarding of more renewables. Um, and so that's why they're positive. But, you know, of course, as soon as those renewables aren't producing, if the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, those guys keep pulling off the grid, you know, and then that's where they're, you know, having a net negative um, effect. Whereas the joy of Bitcoin mining is that if you had a very, very similar model whereby Ireland pushed towards allocating some of this space to Bitcoin mining, as soon as those renewable um, operations aren't producing anymore, the Bitcoin miners would simply shut off. You know, that's kind of a key part of this, which is this whole idea of renewable energy and, and intermittent mining um, and flexible load balancing is a huge part of ERCOT in Texas. Um, and I think Ireland could actually move in a similar manner. So of course, we're gonna have our battery storage systems. Of course, we're gonna have you know synchronous condensers and all of these other mechanisms to keep the grid balanced. But one method of keeping our grid balanced could be allocating some of our data center space to a flexible load like Bitcoin mining. But you, you know we both know that that's, you know, a long long way away and so starting kind of in a, a much much smaller manner and first of all you know going after the methane reduction market is definitely the easiest way to start yeah well look i suppose the great thing is that even if they do try and hinder it for a year or two like seeing how successful it is in america and like some other parts of the world like you know game theory should come into play and it should be kicked back the other way then so that, that the same way that like they tried to they delayed the whole tech scene in europe for a long time and it eventually just washed on in you know yeah exactly i think and as you said yourself like the us is is really flying ahead at the moment you know you've wyoming you know you've all these other you know you've states all over the us 
that are encouraging miners to come. You know, you've the CEO of Aircraft, Brad Jones, there at one stage saying, you know, miners are operating as this perfectly flexible load on our grid, allowing us to onboard more renewables. And you'll keep seeing these stories come out no matter how long it takes the EU to kind of change their tune. Um, and in the meantime, if you took an example whereby all of on-grid mining was banned in Europe, you know, it, it's going to do absolutely nothing. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of key, you know, conclusion that they're going to come to, which is if we ban mining on the grid in Europe and we fast forward two years and they say, okay, well, what happened to the price of electricity after that? Um, and how many miners switched off? The answer is probably going to be the price of electricity is the same or higher and no miners switched off because no one was doing it anyway. Um, I think that'll be kind of a, you know, a key turning point as well, which is if they continue to push through with stuff like this, that doesn't actually have a lot of meaningful difference or change, you know, in the background of why they're doing it. I think they'll ultimately kind of come back and say, you know, why did we do it at all? Um, and so that's hopefully why, you know, we'll be stuck in the middle of it and, you know, hopefully advising to an extent saying, you know, you're going to ban something that will be a net positive and you're going to ban it and it's going to make absolutely no difference to the current existing systems that we have. So, you know, why progress with something like this? Um, but only, you know, only time will tell. We'll see. Hopefully. Um, so look, just to wrap up then, Mark, uh, geez, thanks for your time. We've kind of, I think we've gone way over. <laughs> um, but uh, like, um, just then, yeah, I just asked this question to everyone. Um, like, what would you, do you think there's any, this is totally unrelated now to mining and all that, but where it might be, I'm not sure. Do you think there's anything that needs to be built in Bitcoin that isn't being built at the moment in the space in general? Like, is there anything you'd like to see? Anything you feel you have a burning need for that's just not there? Like, I suppose a, a, a big part at the moment, and it's something that really springs to mind for me, is is just this, the concept of, um, you know, holding your own keys and, you know, wallet solutions. Like, it's something that everyone goes back to. It's something that, you know, I think isn't that difficult, but maybe... It's something that we need to encourage more people to take to self custody their Bitcoin. Um, I think, to be honest, that's a you know a crucial part. But I think aside from building something physical, I think just informing people on you know keep informing people on the difference between Bitcoin and some of the other projects out there, and actually understanding what it is that they're investing. You know that's not a product, but I think if you look at the past kind of six to twelve months, it would have been something that's pretty important for a lot of people to understand before they came in and, and dabbled maybe as much as they did in a number of other projects. But okay, if, if you forget that, a key reason a lot of people lost a lot of money recently is because they left their crypto on exchanges. You know, even if you look, you know, let's just forget Bitcoin for a second. People lost a lot of money because they didn't know how to sell custody, you know, what they, what, what they thought they owned. Um, and so I think, you know, coming up with solutions or even again, going back to education and informing people on how they can sell custody their coins is probably what comes to mind for me. You know, maybe I'll probably think of something else now, you know, over the next day or two that comes to mind. But, but just given everything that goes on, I think it's quite hard to to think of anything else other than self-custody solutions um, and making self-custody solutions as simple as possible for people to implement on their own. Q Fediment. <laughs> yeah, well, you get into Fediment now, you'll have, you'll have to get Obi on at some stage talking about Fediment because he'll be here for another four hours after I leave if you did. <laughs> yeah you'll, you'll have to introduce me if you don't mind i'd love to have him on <laughs> yeah but it'll be the next one it'll be the next one so <laughs> all right then mark look this has been brilliant very very insightful i uh, hope everyone found it useful as well so um where can we find you and what, what's next for skilling yeah well where to find us i suppose our, our website is skillingmining.com um our twitter is at skilling underscore mining or I got that wrong recently, actually. It's, our Twitter is at Skilling Mining as well. Um, and I suppose what, what's, what's next for, for Skilling is just to try to get you know, more meaningful mining operations up and running. Um, so there, there, there's a few things that hopefully I'll be able to let people know about you know, in the coming weeks and months that we're working on. Um, but I suppose a key, a key focus for us is, is just continuing with this whole kind of methane reduction um, mining kind of movement um, and just showcasing that you know, Bitcoin mining can have really meaningful contributions in a, in a positive way for emissions and environment um, and all of those different things. And so that's where we're headed next is just hopefully more operations around Ireland and then as a result of that, hopefully more education on Bitcoin and mining in Ireland, because I think there's, there's, you know, 
a lot of noise in the space at the moment. And I think, unfortunately, Bitcoin is, is the boring thing that a lot of people overlook. And then if you go on to mining, you know, mining is another six steps past just, you know, what is Bitcoin? And so hopefully as we get more mining operations up and running here and people start realizing that, you know, it can be a net positive, they'll become a bit more inquisitive themselves. And, you know, ideally for us, Ireland then becomes a bit more of a, a Bitcoin mining hub and a bit more of a hub in general. Because, you know, as, as we kind of spoke about, you know, at the, at the Edinburgh conference, there's a lot of meetups and there's a lot of talk about Bitcoin um, and Bitcoin mining across the UK at the moment. So, you know, it'd be kind of great to see Ireland kind of put their name on the map as well. Um, and so hopefully, you know, skilling will be right in the middle of all that. Yeah, I suppose you, like you have the initial Bitcoin rabbit hole of like the hardest, most freedom orientated money that's just going to change everything. And then when you go down far enough, you actually start really realizing like, Jesus, this is really good for energy as well. Like, so yeah, um, it's, it's never ending. It's never ending. Exactly. And as, as a kind of key point there, which is sometimes where people get stuck on Bitcoin, especially if they're kind of environmentally focused, is this kind of whole idea of energy consumption. Um, and unfortunately, when they type in, you know, Bitcoin mining energy consumption, it's I won't name any certain outlets, but there are a lot of outlets and a lot of individuals are the first things that come to the fore and they're all negative related. Um, and so if I can kind of be in the background there showcasing that it can be a positive, that will hopefully get more people over that hurdle, which is if they stop at mining or Bitcoin because it's proof of work is negative for the environment. They're given a different kind of alternative route and an alternative kind of learning um standpoint which could be the key difference between them sticking in the space or not send them to this podcast with yeah well hopefully yeah this is exactly hopefully this will be a kind of deep dive for them and allow them to to go from kind of no idea of what's going on to to proof of work is is going to save the planet in quotes <laughs> as they label their talk in edinburgh as <laughs> yeah okay then mark look this has been brilliant so um we'll have to get you back again in a, a couple of months and see how you're getting on Looking forward to it, Jack. Nice one. Thanks, man. Brilliant stuff.